Welcome um, to our MFA graduation reading for 2021. Um, it seems really unreal to have pulled through this year together. This year of watching a militarized white supremacist climate change denying president be ushered out of office after four terrible years, a pandemic grafted over the last stretch of that time. 2020 was a year of great loss, a ground shifting year that required us to slow down and to listen, our ears flat against the earth to ancient songs of sorrow. Excuse me one second. To ancient songs of sorrow that now in this resounding silence of the pandemic can be heard collectively, even by those who are well practiced in the terrible double art of amnesia and denial. The pandemic has been a great teacher for some and a great affirmation of truth for others. A severe teacher whose kindness will be experienced at a delay. I'm sure many of you wondered at times, what is the point of writing in this context? Why write? We are here today because each of you found your way through that question and kept your spirits close to the page, which is another great well of wisdom because it teaches us to practice self-reflection, not to maneuver around discomfort, to look hard, listen deep, to reveal the story beneath the story and to imagine an alternative collective arena. The work in the classroom is no less demanding. We have lifted one another up at times. At others, we have held onto one writer's hand while they dove into the deep sea of their own particular grief. That is no small thing because it requires a whole community's participation. The writers who usher their peers on with respect, who know how to be both subtle and rigorous in their guidance. The readers out there in the world who will ultimately receive the work and the faculty advisors who say, is this what I'm hearing in your words? Is that what you meant? Is that what you're traveling towards? And our staff, our own incredible generous hearted Alyssa, who has provided us all with sanity and with sweets. Where I come from, offering sweets is a reminder to find the sugar in life's bitterness and to offer it up. And Alyssa has done so much of that kind of offering this year. We are so grateful to you. I realize now that rest is in sight, what a great privilege it has been for me to direct the program during such a trying time, to watch you all carry on with such great grace, such patience and resolve. On that note, I'll close with the words of one of our great forebears, that wonderful trickster who survived by laughing, by recognizing the great joke of existence. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. And with that, I think I'll turn it over. Okay, well, I'll go on then. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce Marie Burns tonight. In her thesis, Another Mind, we encounter phenomena like time quakes, which are sort of like earthquakes in our Einsteinian view of uh, you know, the fabric of time and space. We encounter time travelers who are unlike other fictional travelers because they're so much like us, like ordinary people. One line in her novel captured this for me. Everything was interlocked. Everything connected inevitably to one another's build. Edifices were sculpted from the very depths of the cold surface and layered so intricately that it was rumored the fate of both lives, planet and creature, were forever intertwined, come what may. What is so striking about this line is that the builds that it refers to include the architecture of time, which is to say the architecture of the mind, which is to say the architecture of the past, which is to say the architecture of the present and the future, which is to say everything is intertwined, and that's the real power of Marie's writing, her ability to unpack complex ideas in a story where people can slip into the past as easily as we can drive across time zones or think back and relive a moment from childhood that shaped our present 
and yet have the ability to change the present by remembering the past differently. Indeed, the very story we're reading shapeshifts as we go along. It's hard to describe Marie's work because of its complexity, because of this shape-shifting quality. But think of all the things that your normal book of the month club might be, safe writing, you know, predictable kind of stories. And Marie's writing is none of this. I think her whole approach to writing is what stood out to me though, over the course of, you know, the last two years, because you, it's clear that she thinks of writing as a way of thinking rather than plot out a plot that, you know, then marches to its conclusion. Through the drafts that she did of this thesis, you could see her struggling with big ideas like alternative histories and what might have been or things that are about to come and how the great weave of everything influences everything else. Someone once said that some of the most philosophical statements have been made not in books of philosophy, but in works of fiction. And to this, I would like to add that some of the most philosophical experiences have been had in reading fiction and reading Marie Burns fiction is an example of this. So please join me in welcoming Marie Burns to our virtual podium. Thank you, Steve. Oh my gosh, that was really nice um, and generous. And um, it's really been a pleasure for you, um, or pleasure for me to, for, to have you as my thesis advisor. <laughs> um, okay, I will just read, I think, the first couple of pages of my thesis. Um, right. Her arrival was sudden, a blink a chilling blip, the portal itself, a slim shaft that snapped open, suspended above ground, long and dark, its mouth crawling with pellucid mist, the body, a fine shower of particles that spilled from the portal's mouth like water, a fish that instantly inexplicably took to air, her body that wasn't so much a body as a collection of parts, slices of substance now pulsing on the ground, radiating energy, her body that for all purposes of the multiverse was more of an afterthought than tangible reality. A vestigial image that was currently attempting to remember itself, the idea of a body above anything else, the perception of limbs, an anatomical figure that belonged to a certain collected area known as self, or more accurately, a sense of alignment of cognitive points gathering itself to encompass herself, fluid streams of thought and speculation, a lucid dream. Now vacant, the portal fizzled, Tickle, trickles of dew dripped from its sides. Though objectively, the entire event finished quickly. The woman experienced each second like it were days, squeezed to its last drop. With the final snap, the portal shut. Her body began to build. Briefly, the feeling of things floating, waiting, one calf, two feet, her torso stretched, wisp by wisp. Corporal manifestation at this stage took incredible concentration. She was quite literally made of memory, full of ideas. And though she had done this before countless times, too numerous to name or recall without any great detail, she still had yet to come to terms with the feeling, to be claustrophobic without any limiting structure to speak of. Sharp cramp in the abdomen, though the abdomen in question hadn't even established an interior. Her exterior, in fact, still minute portions of matter, positioning, quivering. She had been, after all, already there before the portal had even opened, just hadn't put mind to shape yet. Then she recalled something, an urgent task. The image came to her and she sensed the tightening of leather straps, constriction, weight shifting from one limb to the next, her legs filled out, each fit, fitted with leather boots, a covered chest, shoulders, then stomach, not all full, some still left with gaps as if her body were punctured with holes cut clean through. No blood, no red wash, but clear patches of her face, waist, and thigh, it would have to do. The woman squinted then started walking. She hadn't traveled here before. From where she moved, the world seemed all at once a vast and level plate grizzled by dried vegetation and uh, dips dug into the soil just barely. 
Where once bustling hills and sheer bluffs crowded the low plain, now there were only wrinkled depressions in the otherwise flat wasteland, squat ridges whirling in circular grooves, small burrows pressed and printed like one large puckered fingerprint. In the distance, a few sharp points rose to her right, indicating a coiled mountain range curving inward, a primeval claw crouching against the sunset. Above, a ceiling of low, cumulonimbus clouds bubbled, whist and bronze and deep brown, the picture of planetary fury. She wasn't, in actuality, supposed to be here, not this early, and certainly not alone. She didn't have much of a choice, though, seeing as her kind was dis disappearing, vanishing, ceasing, or perhaps, as some theories put it, simply dematerializing. Perhaps it was a blessing that she hadn't ever known too many of the others. They were a hermit-like bunch, after all. Winged creatures flopped above. They looked young, barely a few weeks old. Their wings, brittle arms cast in gauze, clawed, misshapen. Pebbled mud and weeds cracked under her boots. The tallest shrubs barely reached her calves. Their branches caked with mysterious powder, a scent carried through the air, acrid, hints of singe and fire. She had, apparently, been transported to a burnt one. This was unexpected. The falling had sent her off quickly, practically pushed her to transport. It would seem the tear she was hunting was quite urgent, but if so, why send her on her own? Um, and I think we'll just end there. That was great, Marie. Thank you so much. And now for something completely different. It is a joy to introduce Rebecca Gearhart, whose thesis novel, Yid, is an intriguing mashup of mystery, family history, class, and identity. In a plot ignited by adolescent sexuality and a missing child, she explores multiple strains of Judaism and secularism, mixed marriages and family feuds, sparse exurbs and dense urban corners. Jetting from the United States to Israel and back again, the novel provides a propulsive narrative pleasure. It's also deeply informed. Rebecca enrolled in an immersive Yiddish language program to get the language and texture just right. Reading chapters as her thesis advisor was an exercise in immersion for me too. I dove deep and swam fast to keep up with what Rebecca was up to. If what it means to be a family and what it means to be a Jew lie at the heart of her thesis, violence and sexual coercion are crucial themes, unsettling complications, challenges. And in addition to that ambitious thesis novel, Rebecca's also embarked on a new one that steps out to the edge of the surreal dance floor. Rebecca is an astute and deeply engaged reader, both of her peers' writing and of a broad range of literature. Trained as a visual artist, she's keenly attentive to the precise shades and strokes we writers bring to description, exposition, and meditation, but she also sees writing in its cultural, political, and literary contexts. In her first year, she was a generous, good-humored organizer of dynamic readings that brought the entire South Bend community of writers together. In her second, a dedicated teacher of undergraduates. Her intense commitment to her art and her big-hearted spirit and graciousness have taught those of us in the creative writing program a great deal. I predict fiction fairly tumbling out of her prodigious imagination for years to come. Here's to her brilliant career, Rebecca Gearhart. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, uh, Jonah from the Old Testament is a character in my novel. So I'm gonna read a short excerpt uh, that he features in. Out under the sun, not much happened. As always, Jonah wandered until he found a place with some shade and some water nearby, a dark green river valley, olive trees, thick grass and reeds for the sheep. He and his lazy sheep dogs slept a little, waking only to chase the shade and do a rudimentary head count of the flock. It was in the late afternoon, just before he'd start bringing the flock back that something woke him, a voice, 
Jonah had said. It was a big voice and it came from the sky. Jonah. Jonah thought he was dreaming. He rubbed his face and pushed himself up. A little late in the day, he thought to be having hungover dreams, but weirder things had happened. Then it came again. Jonah, it said. Jonah, standing under an olive tree, looked up. He didn't look around, not down at the river valley or behind himself or to the sides, but up. He looked up. He looked up because suddenly he knew immediately that it was the voice of God. Jonah didn't know what to say. I really have to be getting my sheep back, Jonah finally called toward heaven. He rallied the sheepdogs and started to make his way home. He wanted nothing to do with this. He'd heard about what almost happened with Isaac. No, thank you. Jonah, you can't run from me. Jonah kept going. Jonah, you will go to the land of Nineveh for me. I will not, Jonah said upwards as he trotted behind his flock. The sun was starting to sink. Soon night would come and the wolves would be out. I will not be going anywhere. Thank you for choosing me, but I'm not interested. God went silent. Jonah, relieved, rushed home, going faster than he'd ever gone before. He ushered the sheep into their paddock and fed the dogs, bones, and milk, and closed himself into the tent. He wouldn't open it for anyone, not even Minna. No, he'd stay in the tent. The sheep would go a day tomorrow, go a day staying home. He'd stay in long enough that God would have to pick somebody else. He didn't know much about God, except that God had a certain wrathful reputation. He thought again of Isaac. His hand moved to his throat. Jonah lay down on his mat and tried to quiet his breathing. He thought if he could quiet himself, quiet his mind, he'd be left alone. Outside, his dogs whined for more food, but he ignored them. He could ignore everything. He wanted only to be left alone. Consumed with fear, he was suddenly plunged into a scene from his childhood. He, eight years old, in a field, his slingshot at his feet. He'd been aiming for a bird, a raven, an evil bird, but his wrist wasn't strong, not like his father's. And when he'd let go, the slingshot had snapped downwards and the stone hit one of the flock, a mother sheep, a pregnant one. She lay on her side, bleeding from her stomach. The wound oozed dark red blood, thick and red like something good to eat, like sauce or a stew. Jonah dropped to his knees besides the bleeding animal. He took a clump of dirt, red dirt, red earth, and pressed it into the wound. It turned muddy. The blood kept flowing. The animal moaned. He tried again, pressed dirt into the hole. Tears stung his eyes. His father would kill him. The dirt wasn't stopping the bleeding. He had to do something. He pushed himself up. The ground below the sheep was soft with blood, and he looked around. A rock. He needed a rock. There was one in the brush a few yards away. He ran to it, heaved it up, and carried it on his shoulder. Before he did the thing, he looked down at the animal and he whispered, I'm sorry. The animal was squirming. He hadn't meant to hurt it. All of this had been a mistake, but now it was too far gone. Oh, he smashed her. She went still. The bleeding trickled, then stopped. The rest of the flock trotted away, cried, then settled back into eating. Jonah put the rock down, took a deep breath. He took the animal by her back legs and dragged her. She was heavy. It felt as if the ground were pulling her back away from Jonah, but he persisted. He moved the body, a wake left in its path. He dragged it down the fertile river valley and pushed it into the water. It sunk, bobbed up, and floated away, the water tinged with blood. Thank you. there. I think the honor falls to me to speak next. And I, I just want to say what an honor it is to be able to add my voices to all the voice that were my voice to all the voices that we're hearing tonight. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to come together in community. So thank you to everyone who worked to put this together. And of course, thank you, Alyssa, for getting us all going in the same direction. So um, I get to introduce Elise Husek. It was my honor for the last two years to come to know the work and mind of Elise Husek, a truly ambidex ambidextrous, nay, multidextrous, or even omnidextrous and probably omnivorous thinker whose brainy works take the form of installations and photographs, poetry sequences, and absurdist yet trenchant short novels. In discussion of literature, art, and language itself, I found Elise to be humane, supple, and nuanced, 
testing the pliancy of branching thought and syntax as one might reach out to test the limberness of a branch in spring. It springs. Yet, as with this gesture, her work is also tactile, human, sudden, and near to hand. Elise actually wrote two theses in our time together, How Neon Was the Rope, a work of successive sibylline verses in which a speaker seems to build out a world around her through the AI of physical and linguistic encounter, and Tractatus, in which the mundanities of life as a young female lecturer and art assistant turns the speaker's own body and mind into a hyper-personalized, quiescent, haptic interface. Elise's work is funny, pointed, and smart, and asks the question, is there anything outside the human? Can we use human tools of language and thought to learn about anything beyond ourselves, or even about ourselves? Or is, it or is consciousness just one more folly, one glitchy human tool that can, f that can only fail to map the world because of its huge world-sized exception? It's my pleasure now to step aside so you can experience one piece of the multivalent but always interrogative project that is Elise Husek's work. Thank you so much, Joyal. That was awesome. Um, it's just been such a pleasure to work with you over these past few years. And I just want to thank all the faculty um, and also my peers. Um, so I'm actually going to read a poem from um, a new project, so not my thesis, and then I'll read a poem from Tractatus, which is my thesis. Um, so this first poem is a little bit more lyrical and more serious in tone than the second poem. So hopefully it doesn't feel like whiplash, but it might um, when I move to the second one. So, okay, um, it's called Speak Thesis and it's after Audre Lorde. If in the way of production, I called it out. My friend who almost got killed by a rock, the weather in our own ways. It was namely men, club racked and water later and war weft and then what I still trust, my heart beat regularly. Ungainly spires, not so much tooled as sinking, not so much tooled as pretending to be the problem. Peeped toes blister as we strut, fries drop, cheese on the asphalt, cheese implicated, nearly mitochondrial, history surface, screwed deeper, still the gum, pedaling. My father's own voice in the very asphalt of my heart coordinating ungainly polymers, where he is fashioning the why and the weather. It is the new meaning where nothing is accomplished, foils for gilding, artworks breathe to surface, to spread out over the shush dealing day. Oh, it showed not the monuments glare as heavy as graveyards couldn't touch it imbricated in the former life, my Baba's murder in the Florida Keys to excite, to taught by Porodichne, Laji, Granitze. See how the snapdragon's jaw is the lonely thing here that breaks. Singing bowl or a sink, basin basically decanting the mind via illusory small hours into the red pool of forgotten intent. Okay, um, the next piece is from Tractatus. Um, it's kind of like a collection of prose poems, kind of like a treatise, philosophical treatise, kind of like a novella. Um, yeah. Oh, and there's one thing you should know, there's a reference to Lee, who is um, probably the biggest character in the book. She's um, an artist who's famous for her paintings of the interiors of cars. Um, and the narrator works for Lee in her art factory. Okay, it's called Guarding. 
Another evening walk with him in this frenzy ornamented town. Another lapping lag while on the sidewalk as my blood huffs to get the baton around. Too much coke, too much sugar in the break. We pass, among other things, a statue of a lion who guards the right edge corner of the small white house's driveway. The statue of the lion is weirdly shaped as in it's got its legs folded under it as in it's lying down. I wonder if the lion's posture is contingent on the kind of home it plays in front of. Mine certainly is. When I'm at Lee's, all my back can do is lie down and breathe since it's not random that they have those things. This house is random too, but not the words I sent to you while noticing that lion or that that lion sent to us in the space between our recognizing. Guarding's the word, guarding's got fur, as in it came to us in the space between, as in it deputizes the land of not, furry, sleepy children nodding out with the gesture of a paintbrush amidst granite spires, sighing, the gesture of a mouse, baby blue snuggie, baby pink. So you were saying the lion was doing not that, V lax in front of the port style house with its trinkets parked in the loading belt. Also, the lion was granite and so didn't have any fur. I wondered or was wondering after you pointed to the lion weirdly not guarding his home, his friends, might as well have pointed into the air. Looking for the word to describe his failure, not what word should be filling in the gap, but whether it was worth mentioning at all, whether you were worth it, this breath. Plus, I wanted to save it for myself. I discovered it. I unearthed it in its real beauty, which was not its clicking into this particular question, but it's clicking more generally. Thank you. Um, hello, is it, uh, am I on here? Yep, yeah, all right. Um, so it's um, my pleasure to introduce PJ Lombardo. I kind of want to say first that, that I want to echo um, what, what Azarine said earlier, which is this group has overcome um, quite a bit of obstacles to, to get to where they are. And as the teacher of their final workshop, um, I kind of feel like I have to say that how, how amazing it's been to see how closely you guys have worked together, um, the profound sense of exchange. And I almost feel tempted to give like a co-introduction to PJ and Miss L, who comes after PJ, because it, it's been great to see the exchange going on between PJ and Miss L in class and in their writing and in their thinking about poetry. Of course, the first example that comes to mind of that was um, the semester when I when I dismissed Keats and Dimian, saying that it was not considered one of her his better works, uh, where Miss Ayel chimed in and said, "But I I love Endymion." And soon enough, uh, PJ had decided to rewrite Keats' epic uh, in his own. Uh, in his own language and, and vocabulary, and now I, you know, now I'm now I'm ready to defend Endymion against any naysayers. So thanks, uh, PJ and Misael. <clears throat> but I will introduce PJ separately. So you can here it is. You can spot a PJ Lombardi poem from a mile away. He's got a, the singular vision and singular way of putting words together, even as what he does is a kind of recycling of language from the detrius of US pop and trash culture. His poetry is, a t is, is soaked in surrealism, but it's also, as his rewriting of Endymion might show, um, strongly Keatsian, has a strong lyrical element. For me, the real trick and wonder of PJ's work is that this his use of slang and, and um, you know, slang and, and idiomatic sayings, language that's often used in poetry to be anti-poetic are in PJ's poetry 
the heart of what makes it lyrical. And I think that's like an amazing trick. Um, Peter has been such a, such a, such a wonderful uh, member of our community. And uh, I love, I've loved working with you. And also I have a super strong faith in where you will go from here. Uh, go ahead, take it away. Johannes, thank you so much. You're so kind. And thank you to all, everybody that came out. Um, I'm so happy to have you all here. And thanks to everybody who uh, helped me out these past couple of years. There is not enough lifetimes for me to pay you back. But <sighs> what I'm going to be reading from uh, today is uh, not also not from my thesis, but it's called Emma Crow's Crisis Lyric from a, a chat book that I'm um, working on right now. So kind of a work in prog progress. And I'm just gonna read them all together like in one shot. So here we go. Evacuating crystals, fountains of them, fountains of fountains of fountains of found out my teeth in breath and all the lanterns heave daggers and all the nukes trip and there's floods and oil and lava shoots and sprigs, crass, sporadic, and everywhere is heaven. But I don't even think about, I wax in the mist like a dew drunk crow. I want your skull. Truckload of tilt of mulch up to my neck, crazy glue on two, damned hams, clams, vice on pearl, wake and I'm fighting, fist fighting. Flatulent aperture of fight, 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 blossoms, fight the bees, storms fights the fucking fjords, feral fickle fighting in the foulest feathers, asinine twirl on my pogo till the reverb gurney arrests with vines, post-punk Martian of inconsequential depth boogers, blot my photocopy. Is that a mole, Mars, or your gut squealing? Trench work. I dogpile bubblegum to water drown the battle longs. My captain's a drill, screws me to the chandelier where I dangle out of harmony. Orgies of speedboats stutter the tide, collapse and appear. Legions of earthquake, all the dolls, vomit, bliss, vomit. Like, how are you gonna glue Jack all? I'm on a camera phone call, ball gag, two glow sticks, stuff my nostrils, ape noises, ape noises, slack in my wrist rattles fat of bacon. Caffeinated ass, when all the buzzards flick gone and rubies stab the marble, again I'll fur myself with oil and roast in fat sun's blur, surrendering. Feed me, copper scarecrow, among these lightning crops. I'm pouring snow day flare and a shot to peel tire, and uh, I'll see you round. Don't mistake it, steer clear, as cord, windows, I hone, my horns on yours, our tackle of one another in, cave sketches, demo tapes, ooze, oozer. Swan and sheets all apple April, you puncture the walls with your shoulders, we roll in hot snow. I'm trying to find ballast fucking everything. That crunchy drum kneading your chest, spoon it with me, soupy. Pawing ugly at a futile honeycomb. La la laying in your tattered pod like grizzlies in the mush. Earthly prosperity munches dust, so everyone and me and you quits. It's nearly wicked. Oh my, oh my. A grin is where the pain gets in. Syrupy sundial curve mint commas or fangs budding. Can't you see androids of androids seating me? And up in the laundromat rafters, plops green candy pinches from rivers, skies, taxidermied. Shitty caress of potatoes breach, crows hiking, each of your shoulders wash out. A powdery dive, a band of meadow, Baby, get the shit off of me. Crumbs from God. Yeah, um, I think I'm heralded to prosper grotesque, whether I'm willing or not. A. The vein of the green imposter is here to gargle you. Untuck me, God's sakes. 
towing, nuke roaring like a hole in your pimple, rewinding. I leapt a rail and now I'm sped, whisking through onyx, fertile beaches overcrowded, rewinding. Emerald web clipping in the gusts, so sick of pie birding, mic up my cavity, cruising a crack of jaw down nightlights, pierce, hon on a print, lilting, curving, in hell's face, a peach. This one's called Cowboy. Under a gigolo moon palpitates, my aorta drenched cashew of oblivion, much prized by the populace, son of a holler pumper. But that's junk up my capillary helix of them. Or old snot, no quitting, you fucking idolater. Everywhere is a parable for a steer out the pub, and you're failing, a grace. And inside the centaur, two seeds flash their murders, twinkle pauses, shuffles spits. I'm off Pacific Way, gonna cave my face on a cactus, lurid draining. This one's called Emily, it's the last one. Bunker penchant, writhing in the wild grass like green cataracts. Suspended in, molecular scatter, I upend my scraps. Buzzing cutthroat, yes, I'm torching. Photographs, chocolate. I stir my velvet head, full of bullets like Vegas. Smashed a jug, blew the splinters, syllable thwacked, yawning sharp pirouette. My name's Emma and I'm fleeter than a tear. Starry robe, stewing, folding, slant, natura, whatever, and forget the solar, Amherst will swallow me. Wild nights, 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 wild nights. Goodbye. Thank you, PJ. That was so great. Um, it's not often I get to have the poets in, in my classes, but I have had the pleasure of having a few of you in my uh, body politic class and it's just been wonderful to get to know your your minds um, so thank you pj i will be introducing uh jasmine ortiz uh it's such a pleasure to have worked with you jasmine and to watch you kind of come into your own over the last two years um you know you from a place of of tremendous doubt, which is, I think, the best place for a writer to be to, to having this kind of fully formed thesis that's, it's just been incredible to watch. So Jasmine Ortiz's The Stories They Gave Me is an enigmatic work of documentary fiction that draws from memory, art history, myth, and popular culture to reveal how the layered network of relations between these component parts shapes identity, community, gender, language, and our sense of reality. Jasmine is a patient, intuitive writer, one with a painter's eye. She transplants commonplace interactions and objects on the page with such decisive focus that the reader has the impression they are looking at a still life painting or a portrait. Things can get very quiet in Ortiz's work terrifyingly so. An entropic energy threatens to overtake the stillness, making her writing viscerally evocative, deceptively still and quiet. There's something even stranger happening though. The humans hardly speak. They are motionless or exist in memory, nested in the body of our narrator, our orator, our person who remembers all of this. But the land and its animals and the wind that blows through the valleys are full of sound. They speak loud and clear in a hypnotic rhythm that lulls us into a trance and transports us elsewhere, deep into Mexico profundo and back out again. She is a marvelous inventor. It's no surprise that she won this year's Sparks Prize, judged by Amina Kane. The imagery Kane writes of Ortiz's work is vivid, sometimes lovely, sometimes strange, imprinting itself on the mind. It often combines with sound in an interesting way. Here is an example of that. 
And then uh, slowly with her eyes closed and with the sight in front of her still lingering in her brain, she moves her hand through her horse's mane. Her fingers are thin and long, her hands rough and calloused in a way only horse reins can make them. The hair moving back and forth, back and forth between her thumb and fingers, sounding like static, but more strange and out of place in the quietness of the land. That's just one example of her magical sentences. It's my pleasure to hand it over to you, Jasmine. Thank you so much. That was so, that was so kind. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's been an honor having you see my work, Ozarine. So I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody else's presence in the program. Um, I'm going to be reading from my thesis. It's part, it's from part two of my thesis. There are three parts and it's a complete story. So hopefully that's good. <laughs> uh, it's called Planting a Tree with Bapi. She is five, she thinks. She can't keep track of how many fingers to hold up, but she can feel the way the wet dirt presses against her little feet. She can hear the noise, nose of the shovel as it cuts into the blades of thick sana thin grass. She can hear Bobby grunting, can hear the way he laughs as he pulls up a shovel full of earth with worms in it and sees the way her eyes widen, hears her take in a little girl gasp. Lombriz, Bobby says. He holds it up. They watch it twist and squirm. She has gaps in between her teeth, soft and viscid, pink. She can feel them, the little growth, as she pushes her tongue out, as she tells him, ew, ew, as she says, as she says no, papi, no. When he dangles the worm closer and closer in front of her small, rounded face, they are planting a tree. This is what he said. Un árbol de limón. It's, it's little right now, but watch, it'll grow. He shoveled a lot until the dirt turned to clay. She likes this puppy. She likes that he smiles. She likes that he digs. She likes that they are both a little bit covered in mud. She likes that his hair is dark, no trace of white or gray. She likes that she's not worried about her hair, her own little face. She especially likes her overalls and Bobby's deep blue jeans. She likes that she sees him wipe dirt on these. She likes it so much she looks at her own hands and she does the same thing. He picks up the tree. They can see the roots. He lifts it up higher, inspecting the lemon tree base. He places it in the ground, lets her little girl hands reach out, lets her help him put it in its place. Andale, andale, he says. He gets on one knee, he points at the dirt. Start shoving it back over the hole we made in the earth, he tells her. They pat it down and pack it well. She can see her hand next to his, looking small and dark, covered in earth, covered in a deep colored clay. Their fingers, his big and her small, are stained. Their nails in that small crescent shape at the top are dark, muddy. They look nice. The hands, her little girl ones and his. His, papi, papi lindo, papi chulo, que ternura, que hermosura. He's smiling, he's laughing, he's looking at her, he's happy. He and she, they planted a tree. If you ask her what she's thinking while standing under the shade of the tree, large and tall now in the passage of time, she won't say anything at first. She'll look at the greenery all around her, at the life of the land. She'll kneel down, touch the dirt, darkened by a, damp a dampness in there. For just a moment, a smile, small and fleeting. If, her ask, if you ask her again, she'll say, well, or sorry, if you ask her again, say, well, que piensas? She'd wait a moment, wait in a silence full of breeze and shade and chirping birds. And then she'd say, I don't know. If you laughed, risa. If you said, como no, she'd say, see, sí, it's true. So many memories, so much recuerdo, all of it. It feels like a dream. Usually it hurts to smile, she hears the taller people complain, but she smiles a lot, and Bobby does sometimes, and smiling doesn't feel like it hurts, not really, not today. That's it, thank you. <clears throat> All right, so it's my turn to introduce Misael Osorio Conde. Um, first of all, I think everybody will uh, immediately on hearing Misael read recognize the, uh, a, a kind of beautiful hypnotic quality his reading has 
but it's important, I think, not to forget or to miss, or maybe it's not important, I don't know, but along with this hypnotic, beautiful um, musicality that reshapes the English language, I think about his poetry as, some, uh, as a poetry that thinks really hard about how and why we tell stories and about what part of our lives so that the poetry does not just comply with the strong convention in U.S. poetry to see language as a neutral vehicle, but is multi-layered and self-interrogating. It's also poetry that is has a has a has a kind of religious vis vision to it, but it's a religious vision about its own impossibility, which I think to me is is um very seems to be very i mean to me i'm just very just taken in by that the, the kind of um paradox of that um and also i want to say again that uh you know thanks Ms. L, not only for writing great poetry devote uh, super devotion to your to your art but also the great rigorous and generous engagement with other people's poetry over these two years. Um, uh, it's been such a pleasure having you in the program. Uh, take it away. Johannes, thank you very much for that uh, kind and generous introduction. I just wanna take the opportunity to thank everybody to show up to our reading uh, and also thank my peers for your amazing support and for making this MFU years a wonderful time that like PJ was saying, I don't think I'll be able to ever repay. And I just wanna, uh, I think there's one way to, to repay that. Uh, and I think as long as we continue to support each other, we'll be able to uh, to achieve some sort of repayment. So with that, I'm, on, I'm gonna read three poems and I'll just follow PJ's lead from earlier. I'll just read through them. Uh, this one's called, When We Were Left Behind, We Had to Live Too. Because I've read more, don't mean that I've found friends or peace of mind. But don't be so sad, don't be so guilty to come from public places of modern paper. It's only paper ships we insist on missing. Because I work and I couldn't breathe. And I said, Pa, I can't go on like this. Like this silence makes us stronger. I don't want to do this anymore. Like we have years to throw to the dogs. I don't want to feel anymore like crying because the line frightened me because the poem made me question your promises. But you never thought I'd make the movie. Forget that, never thought I'd make it. So now I take yours like it was love offer, no questions asked. Offer nothing in return, since my hands refused to stick to anything material. I've taken this word for granted as a breathing. I've taken your words in vain, as in against your exalted beauty. Had you hung by your feet from barbed wire of the great border fence, you dare crawl under, running away from my knock The second piece is called No More Cranes in Orange Groves. Frágil soy después, poeta. La frontera olvidó desechar mis memorias. Ya yo, aunque aún tuve solución, te regreso al poeta. Sus ojos on the ground apuntaban su último respiro. De regreso cargando baldes llenos de noche. Sus padres eran niños, algo que parece trágico. He never had a chance. One fragile bloom of carbon I am, after all, only direction counts to the poet when he crossed the crossing out of his memoir. Later, I will go on to recount how even though my guru for water was filled with ash, I still had to drink the warming solution to talk back to the poet, how his eyes pointed towards the Salton Sea before he breathed his last. It had been centuries, perhaps, since he'd been back to his village. Or was it his parents' village? 
my work children then, in my count amounts to anything resembling tragic fall of PV drops. When the soldier with his dogs chased them past the hills, he never had a chance. Forgive me though, I don't have access to these places. And this is the final piece. It's called, it's like the story where nothing ends and nothing begins. The man handed me a bowl. There was no water in it. When in the place of a salt water grows, a darkness and a home. Glory me, tear me so shiny, so, so chrome, and rage going off in a ball and red flicker to a nothing but a handful of ashes. Ashes in the desert. Deserted island of one's disasters and dream vapor. Eyes, no soul. Remains of a great vision, clouds of smoke. So vanishing in the suffocating heat, the vapor vanishes and dreams of green and dreams agreeing that the green has dreamed. So was the terror. So was the heat thumping. So that the green so green. In the drumming of a heart in heat, blind to the whimpers, where the water should be, a voice. It's just a voice which calls me Misa. Miss. Misses a home. Misses the green. Misses the dreams. This is the song. And I call back in the instinct of survival. I call back to our hero. Can always carry the weight of another me. Glory, chains, dust and all. To the corruption of green, shadows, dream green, dear, oh glory me. A perfect green future of us in us. Dreaming without deformity. And a mouthful of teeth and a hose washing of the dust from the passage through the vapor, or was it the ball? That song, that fierce storm, that parting of the sea. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, all these readings are just forming such a spectacular and intense fabric. It just feels amazing to be suspended in it. Um, so it's both my pleasure and with some reluctance that I we come to the end of the reading, but it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Valerie Vargas's reading. So more and more, I've been thinking about the power of scale and the notion that it might be in the manipulation and investigation of scale that both the aesthetic and political dimensions of the lyric may be felt in their most truest and most confounding dimensions. This is certainly true in the work of Valerie Vargas, which in her supple grasp manages to move from hemispherically distant to extremely close range within the turn of a page or a phrase. With consummate skill, intensity, and aim, Valerie reverses polarities of intimacy and distance, blur and focus, until we find ourselves immersed in the true profundity of immediacy itself. Immersive, immediate, surprising, fluid, grief-filled, yet brushed with wonder. This is a poetry preoccupied with the cosmic prerogatives of Miami weather systems and with the dyadic rituals of housewives and houseflies. This is poetry born simultaneously into transgenerational memory and the cosmic mundanity of everyday life. Valerie is a devotee of the infinitesimal in both its senses the largest and the tiniest of realms. She insists on both. She is a lyric cartographer of vertiginous effects. When I read Valerie Vargas's poems, I feel way up in the air. And yet, like a cave diver, I hold my breath. It's my pleasure to introduce you all to these very special effects. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone who supported us along this way. Um, definitely a couple of years that I will hold close to my heart forever. I will be reading three poems um, from my thesis. Anthology of Wildflowers. I grew lovesick and all I could do was eat flowers. I started picking buttercups and dropped the buttons on my tongue. Once I started, I couldn't stop. I'd melt then find myself near fences and meadows with overgrown grass long after curfew, tea candles and matchsticks to guide me. 
I picked as many as I could and hid them in my fur behind my ears. I split myself every day just to know I could have them. My fur was yellowing. I would hiccup and butter would bubble from my mouth. The sky used to drop nails and it stopped sobbing for a while. My grandma started to notice my restlessness. She watched me hop outside after dinner one day and said, Dígame, mija, ¿cuándo vas a dejar de comer flores silvestres? She even started to vary our meals, sprinkle Spanish needles on salads and boil hojas de llantén for tea, but they weren't buttercups. I grew hungry. Nothing tasted anymore. The ground was shaking again and marshes began to drought like my eyes and redden. The sky cracked in half. I started to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig until the ground caved in and my paws caught the water rushing in its mouth. From a past life. Once sipping water from the edge of a river, a warm rabbit chased the sun into a vacant hollow, bright with the dirt of yellow eyes, dandelion's eyes, sprouting from the ceiling of the blueberry night, plucked from a bushel of a million little skies. Once upon a time, a rabbit sipping water from the edge of a river and one who was snake bitten came to cut her foot clean from her hawk like she began to cry and cry and cry and cry. Rivers the length of moonbeams that tore down streetlights, emptied houses. Men had to build bridges to cross them. Once I tried to swim the rivers and was swept so deeply I emerged from a flare in the sun. Gone fishing. In a dream, I was a rabbit on a quest through the swamp to gather wildflowers. My knees turn green where I kneel, remembering your every favorite flower. And I dust the shook where there was love. Here I am, strung by the frayed threads of a storm, counting the midnight thunder in my house of pink glass. The last night I went to the water, sulk kept the sunken lilies strung to my boat, palms twirled and danced in the grass. The night is deep, emerald trembling in the swamps of my dark dreams. A sand pine, my crater, oh rhizome, I spit a canal into the ear of this Midwest town and loose a flock of black birds to eat the hollow points in the sky. Here is a wooden box I dredged from a dream to be buried in, to keep them to the wild matter, pulled from flesh like rotten teeth. My babies reborn as rabbits tell you everything about hell in a past life. In a past life, a seagull built a nest on the river of grass and came to find me. All that remains remained like white sleet swelling the rain. I want to go to Florida, cross the water like an alligator going home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. And thank you everybody for your just gorgeous readings. Um, yeah, so we're moving on to the part of the ceremony where we acknowledge our prizes. Um, so, the Sparks Prize, uh, which is awarded to a distinguished graduate of the creative writing program as a post-graduation year of residency and writing time, is funded by Nicholas Sparks, goes to Jasmine Ortiz. It's based on the quality of the writing and the likelihood that the submission will be published or will, or will be developed into a publishable book. So um, congratulations, Jasmine, and we hope to, to see you sending your manuscript out um, in the months to come. Um, congratulations to Rebecca Gearhart for winning the Mitchell Award for Distinguished Achievement and Contributions during Residency for the MFA degree in the Graduate Creative Writing Program. The Mitchell Award is designed to honor one MFA second year student for their special contributions to the creative writing program. The idea is the student who has been the most involved citizen in the program um, 
and one of its best writers and Rebecca, um, who was actually uh, the runner up for the Sparks Prize has also been just such a phenomenal citizen of the MFA program. And we're indebted to you for, for bringing everybody together and um, creating community with your peers, especially, you know, in your first year. And I I think that was instrumental in helping us all get through this very weird second year. So thank you, Rebecca. And then finally, Valerie Vargas, um, who is one of the poets I've had the pleasure to really get to know this semester. Um, uh, congratulations to you, Valerie, for winning the Samuel and Mary Ann Hazel Poetry Award. Um, the recipient's work reflects Hazo's humanistic aesthetic and ideals and commitment to poetic craft. Selected by unanimous decision from current poetry faculty and based upon thesis, students' class performance, and contribution to the creative writing community and the MFA program, um, that's pretty much how, how you landed this award, Valerie. So congratulations. And I just want to emphasize that you guys, you know, in our eyes are all award winners and more. We're so excited to see where, where you land in the coming years. And, and we hope that you know that this is always a place of community for you, that you can always rely on um, your faculty advisors and, and the cohort as a whole, um, you know, to, to have that kind of support built into your writing and your, and your practice as writers um, and stewards of literature. So it's been such an honor and a pleasure to hear you all read. Um, thank you so much. And I think we can, we can conclude here. Uh, it's too bad that we can't get together for a drink to toast you all, um, but we'll be toasting you all remotely from our homes. Take good care. Bye.